Hello and good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at uh, SOAS. And it is my great delight to introduce the speaker for tonight. An excellent talk uh, for the last of our series before Reading Week. We'll continue after Reading Week, so please do come back. Um, I was hoping, I think there will, a few people will join us um, a bit later. Um, you know, we have assignments coming up on Friday, which was maybe not such a good idea, but there was such a demand for the, you know, having a diverse array um, of deadlines that now students have excuses almost every week not to come. Anyway, so uh, our speaker today is Dr. Roselle Mead. She's a lecturer in Japanese studies uh, in the School of Modern Languages at Cardiff University, and she researches translation in 19th and 20th century Japan with a particular interest in how narratives and concepts are transfigured through translation. And I think I can say this also very closely related to science and technology studies, which is a shared interest. And if you remember past um, installments uh, last year of the lecture series, we've dealt with uh, the history of science in Jap Japan in uh, particular. Uh, Russell Mead is a co-editor along with Claire Shi and Kyung Hem Kim of the Routledge Handbook of East Asian Translation. And her recent articles include Minakata Kumagusu in London, Challenging Eurocentrism in the Pages of Nature, um, which was published in Notes and Records, the Royal Society Journal for the History of Science and Science Across the Meiji Divide, Vernacular uh, Literary Genres as Vectors of Science in Modern Japan. So we'll follow a traditional academic format uh, with the talk first. Uh, please hold your questions to the end of the talk. If you are joining us online, you can feed into your questions either into the Q&A uh, function or into the chat. Her talk tonight uh, bears the title, A Black Hero for Japanese Youth, Recounting the Life of Toussaint L'Ouverture in Meiji, Japan. Please give a big welcome to Dr. Russell Mead. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, it is very nice to be uh, back at SOAS. I was actually, um, I studied here, I did, um, I studied translation here and it was at SOAS that I started to see translation not just as a practice but also as a, a sort of object of study, um, something that could give insights into um, wider contextual and societal, wider societal context. Um, and so yeah, that, that's the approach that I take uh, to translation, and I've done so ever since. Um, all of the uh, works that uh, Dr. Gigi um, mentioned um, look at translation and how concepts uh, are transfigured as they move. So it's less about questions of fidelity and about what translation can tell us about the context in which it occurs. So it's with that eye that I approach uh, Japanese translations of uh, the Haitian Revolution and its foremost uh, revolutionary hero, Toussaint Louverture. So some might find it interesting to discover that there are a multitude of writings about the Haitian Revolution and about Toussaint Louverture in Japanese, but these date back to the late 19th century and continue uh, to the very least to the last decade of the 20th century. So the work that I um, will discuss today is part of a wider study that looks at these multiple renderings of the Haitian revolution um, in Japanese and how this, these are uh, transfigured and reconfigured according to the priorities and agendas of uh, their Japanese writers. And to understand more about the context in which they mobilize um, the Haitian Revolution. So they're making arguments for a Japanese context, but using uh, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, today, I just focused on one of these translations. Uh, it was published in 1890, and it's likely to be the earliest account of the Haitian Revolution in Japanese. Although I focus on only one of these multiple renderings that I've mentioned, I think this one work uh, reveals some commonalities that other renderings, uh, even into the 20th century, share. 
Uh, the first, uh, and perhaps a pro provocative statement, is that attempts to grapple with issues of race in Japan have always, inf have always been informed by an engagement with the idea of blackness. So to borrow Robert Tierney's words, which he used in a different context, the Japanese understanding of race has consistently had a triadic character. So it involved not just entanglements or the encounter between Asia and Europe, but also entanglements with uh, Africa and its diasporas. And I think that this is an important point that continues to be overlooked in discussions of race um, in Japan, but in, in Asia uh, more generally. Japan's encounter with Europe and with Europeans has been from the very beginning intertwined with its encounter with Africans. Uh, Yes, this one. Okay, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just start again um, with that. Um, so Japan's encounter with Europe and with Europeans has from the very beginning been intertwined with its encounter with Africans. Uh, Japanese contact, uh, contact with Portuguese and Spanish Iberian Jesuit missionaries in the 16th and 17th centuries, and then with Dutch merchants throughout the Tokugawa period, brought contact with enslaved Africans. Then in the mid 19th century, when Japan and the United States came into contact, African Americans were also part of that, that encounter. Uh, when Commodore Matthew Perry came uh, um, with his, um, his huge coterie, he brought along with him, um, and deliberately so, black sailors and bodyguards to play a prominent role in the pageantry of his arrival. Uh, these encounters continue into the treaty port period. Of course, treaty ports were highly cosmopolitan melting pots, and you had soldiers um, from various European colonial uh, territories rubbing shoulders together. So this is one of the images that uh, Midori Fujita uses in her work that charts uh, these encounters and representations of these encounters um, uh, with, um, um, with Black people in Japan. So this yosei, uh, yose, or caricature, was produced in the Edo period, so in the early 19th century, by Utagawa Kuniyoshi. And it is a caricature of uh, Utaga, sorry, of As Asahina Yoshihide, who's uh, a Kamakura-era military commander. And this is just one of the many representations of Black people uh, during the Edo period. So if you've had a chance to look at it, what you will notice is that um, this picture or this print is made up of the bodies of uh, various um, humans. Um, if you look at the hands, the head, all of these are, are bodies. Um, but what you will notice is if you look at the hair at the back of his head, you can see two black uh, bodies uh, there. So if you look, um, there's one hanging off um, the top on, uh, on the top knot and one underneath there. So this is just one example, um, and in, in the work, uh, Fujita Midori um, takes us through this long line of representations that bears testament to this encounter with, uh, with Black others. I should make the point, however, that at this point, um, Black does not necessarily equate with African. Black is referred as a color of uh, skin, not a marker of origin. And so, in, in this, at this point, these ideas of, of blackness are not necessarily um, related to um, notions of origin, but that does become uh, the case. So that was my sort of first point about the commonalities of these translations is that um, that importance of blackness to understanding race. The second uh, commonality in the multiple renderings of uh, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution is the position of the United States. So the towering political, economic, and cultural influence of the United States shapes how the Haitian Revolution is received in Japan. And we'll see um, that it is an American publication that is the source of the 1890 biography of Toussaint Louverture.
Okay, so first I'll give a, a very brief account of the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint Louverture's role in it. Um, I keep it brief as I presume a SOAS um, audience is likely to need, lead very little um, introduction. Um, okay, so the site of the Haitian Revolution is in the then French colony of Saint-Domingue, uh, the west of Hispaniola or Little Spain, so-called by uh, Christopher Columbus. After the arrival of Columbus, uh, there are attempts to enslave and use the labor of indigenous Taino and Siboni peoples uh, due to repression. Uh, so this is in response to revolt by indigenous people and disease. The indigenous Taino uh, population declines sharply. And so the labor of this indigenous population depleted by genocide is replaced by that of enslaved Africans. At the time of the beginning of the revolts, um, so this is in uh, 1791, Saint-Domingue was described as la Perle des Antilles. It was France, so the Pearl of the Antilles, of the Caribbean. It was France's most important colonial territory with sugar, coffee, and indigo produced by the enslaved population, accounting for half of um, the amounts consumed in Europe and Americas and the Americas at the time. Plans for the uprising of 1791 were hatched, it is said, at the bois gathering that you see depicted here. Uh, at the center is uh, the African-born Bukmandetti, and you can see in white, um, uh, Cécile Fatima. She is the daughter of an enslaved African woman and a white Frenchman. Uh, it's through this gathering, uh, which has a, a very strong uh, spiritual and religious dimension, that the 1791 uprisings begin. One of the peculiarities of Saint-Domingue society was its large and economically power powerful free population of gens du couleur, so uh, people of color. Um, so it must be stressed that these are, this is economically powerful. So they have plantations, they um, use enslaved labor, but they don't have um, political or social power. Uh, they are largely, but not exclusively, uh, people of mixed heritage, usually enslaved African mothers and French fathers. And they uh, have plantations, as I said, and they own slaves. With the French Revolution of 1789, they see an opportunity to argue for their political rights. Uh, this appeal is at first violently repressed, but eventually they, the Jean du Couleur are granted citizenship in 1792 to quell revolt. <laughs> Later, the island is attacked by the Spanish and the British, and Fra France offers freedom to the slaves to join the French troops, and it's at this point that we see the emergence of Toussaint Louverture. So Toussaint Louverture is a military hero who leads troops to defeat the Spanish and the British. Uh, when Napoleon ascends to power, um, so this is in the uh, in French Revolution, um, uh, so he wants to reimpose slavery um, on the territory. So the slaves are offered, uh, enslaved population are offered freedom because of the fight against the uh, Spanish and British to co-opt them into that. Um, however, with Napoleon's uh, rise, there's an attempt to reimpose um, slavery, um, but Louverture, he uh, turns um, the tables on the French, de defeats Napoleon's uh, troops uh, and defeats them. And so in effect, you have a free uh, population, um, but still tied to France. In the end, however, uh, Napoleon uh, sends for Louverture to be kidnapped um, and he's taken to France where he is imprisoned and he dies in 1803. However, as Louverture prophetically announced when he was captured, they had cut down only the trunk of the tree of liberty of the blacks. It will grow back from the roots because they are deep and numerous. So on New Year's Day, 1804, Saint-Domain is declared independent and renamed IT. Uh, IT is an indigenous name, um, meaning mountain, mountains or mountainous. So Haiti is a land of the mountains. It becomes only the second independent state in the Americas and the world's first black republic. And it's important because the country does then say it's a black republic. And by essence, by being a citizen of Haiti, you are designated as black. Um, of course, at this point, uh, Toussaint uh, Louverture is, um, has died, uh, and one of his lieutenants, uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, um, is the one who declares independence and declares himself um, emperor. 
So Toussaint Louverture was born enslaved in Saint-Domingue in about 1843. However, by the time of the Haitian Revolution, he had been manumitted. So in other words, he was a free man and was an overseer on a plantation, owning himself, owning himself, he owned, <laughs> sorry, enslaved persons. He was literate and had high status. Um, as mentioned, he demonstrated um, acute military nous, uh, leading troops to defeat the foremost European um, imperial powers of the age. So Toussaint Louverture was introduced to the Japanese reading public in 1890 through the pages of the Japanese juvenile magazine Shonenen, uh, Shonenen meaning the youth's garden. So even prior to the, um, before his death, uh, no, he, um, Louverture had been the subject of extensive biography. Um, by the time of his death, there were already accounts of his life in France, Britain, Germany, Italy, and many other places, but, and we can be quite certain of this, not in Japan. So you can sense the shock in this introduction, which I've uh, copied here, in the editor's introduction of the discovery of this black hero who led an army of enslaved Africans to victory against uh, European powers. From its cover, the 3rd November 1890 issue was like any other. However, once it was opened, it was clear that rather than the usual mix of letters from readers, general interest articles, short stories, um, that it was in fact a pamphlet. And this pamphlet was singularly devoted to Toussaint Louverture, who was introduced as a black hero. And in the introduction, uh, the writer, the editor of the magazine, um, he said that this person who he was about to uh, introduce ranked not among, but above well-known heroes such as Washington and Napoleon. And these were people who went only by single names and needed no introduction. But he went on to say, despite being a hero whose equal had not been seen in thousands of years, these are his words, he was certain that the magazine's readers had not heard of him. The reason that the editor was so compelled to introduce Toussaint Louverture was that he expected this biography to overturn what had by 1890 become a consensus, the existence of a concept called race and a belief that these races could be ranked in a hierarchy. And I'll take a sip before moving on. So scholars uh, of the Meiji period, uh, including, for example, Yuki Terazaka, have pointed out that as a scientific concept, race was introduced and popularized in Japan in the 1870s and the 1880s through the adoption of social Darwinism um, and anthropology. Um, of course, there was what might be called indigenous racism, as some describe it, prior to this period, but these attitudes did not necessarily mean that there was an, a very developed concept of race. Uh, I should point out that in this, um, from what follows in discussing uh, this period and this topic, um, certain terms, of course, outdated terms will be used, which uh, are obviously considered uh, pejorative. So I should let you know that in advance. So scientific studies of race started um, with the arrival of European and American scholars invited to Japan at the beginning of the 1870s. And as the concept of race was introduced, so too was the no notion of racial hierarchy. In this hierarchy, the uppermost position was of course occupied by Europeans with East Asians in the middle and African and various indigenous peoples at the bottom. And there were many variations um, and elaborations of this basic model, but overall its tenets were the same. Broadly speaking, there were two main approaches to understanding race and racial hierarchy in the major period. In one view, uh, race was an essential and inherent category, so it could not be transcended. In the other, race was a civilizational marker. So it was um, something that could be transcended. It was just a snapshot of the current state of human affairs. One intellectual 
um, who did much to promote the civilizational understanding was, of course, he, he, someone you will uh, know, uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi. In his 1869 bestseller, uh, Sekai Kunizu, sorry, Kunizu Kushi, uh, he divided the people of the world into four categories. He did not use the language of race, uh, referring instead to peoples, but the notion of hierarchy is pervasive in his work. He describes the lowest category, comprising what he calls the most inferior people, as chaos, konton. And in this group, he places the indigenous peoples of Australia and Inner Africa. The category above this is barbarian, or banya, the uh, yet uncivilized, or mikai. And then at the top are uh, the bunmei kaika. And as examples of this group, he cites the United States and Western European nations such as Britain, France, and Germany. So these uh, coexisting conceptions of racial difference um, informed Meiji era debates about, um, about Japan and its population. And of course, it was a huge concern at this time, uh, the idea of the betterment of Japan's international position. And so those who saw race in essentialist terms uh, tended to be proponent, proponents of um, what we might call eugenicist approaches. So, for example, in um, in his 1884 essay, uh, Nippon Jinshu Kai, Kai Ryoron, A Treatise on the Betterment of the Japanese Race, the journalist Takahashi Yoshi encouraged marriage between Japanese and European to create what he called taller, heavier, and stronger Japanese people, and in doing so, increase the competitiveness of Japan in the international arena. For those of a civilizational bent, emulating European imperialism was the most obvious route to betterment. Uh, so as early as 1869, the scholar Hosokawa Junjiro argued that Europeans had made themselves uh, the nobility of the world by importing slaves from China, India, and Africa, and that Japan should emulate them by importing slaves for household tarts, tasks and more arduous labor in farming and shipping. The editor of Shonenen, the one who introduces Toussaint Louverture, was clearly a, a proponent of the civilizational approach. And so far, I haven't named um, the editor, but he is most likely Yamagata Teisaburo. Um, most of the works in uh, this magazine written by him were unattributed. Um, and so this one as well was unattributed. Um, his hand was very clearly over much of the material in the magazine. So prior to his uh, translation of the biography of Toussaint Louverture, uh, he had already shown a keen interest in matters of race. Mm -hmm. So in 1886, he had published an abridged translation of Charles Darwin's The Descent of Man and, Se and Selection in Relation to Sex, alongside excerpts of Ernst Haeckel's The History of Creation. Um, in focusing, sorry, in abridging Darwin's work, he focused um, on selection, sexual selection, selection in relation to sex. Darwin's biographers argue that the focus on sexual selection um, in, in this work, Descent of Man, was motivated by the desire to explain racial difference in humans. Dar Darwin's arguments was that preferences for mates explained the differences in skin color, hair, and so on. And so this supported a monogenetic understanding of race. And by that, I mean that we all um, descend from a common ancestor. And so this under, undermined what was known as a polygenetic um, understanding of race, uh, whereby races had different uh, origins and people and polygenists were typically proponents of slavery. That was one of the key uh, underpinning um, uh, arguments for slavery. So Louverture's appeal, so the appeal of uh, Toussaint Louverture to Yamagata was that he was an example of someone who had transcended the racial hierarchy uh, and in the, the introduction to his biography, he argued um, the following. He said, there may now be inequality on earth, but as far as the heavens were concerned, all men are created equal. Only the ignorant cannot see this. So he did not dispute that there were different levels of civilizational attainment. So he went on to say, yes, there's civilizational attainment, but he argued these change over time. 
So um, uh, he was a keen um, uh, Chinese scholar. And so he pointed to Chinese um, history, um, pointing to the fall of Haojing, the capital of the Zhou Kingdom in the eighth century, noting that impermanence was a feature of all human affairs. Everything that rises, he said, must at some point decline. So he then uses the language of color, which jars with his civilizational understanding, but he said whites are at the top, and then he uses the color um, um, common to uh, at the time. So he says yellow next, red, and then black below. He said, though that is the case now, in the future, the situation will be reversed. And as evidence, he pointed to the glories of non-Europeans, such as uh, Shakyamuni and Genghis Khan, and his argument that civilizational change was possible was then bolstered by his introduction of Toussaint Louverture. So in his presentation of uh, Toussaint Louverture, Yamagata, so um, the, pu the publisher of the Japanese biography, pushes against um, received wisdom about the capacity of black people, and in this case, meaning people, uh, African descended people to achieve, achieve civilization. In this sense, he fits within what the anthropologist David Scott has described as the vindicationist tradition. So David Scott, uh, describes vindicationism as an intellectual move to mobilize history to challenge the dehumanization of Black people. As Scott points out, in the early 19th century, many abolitionists, um, especially British ones, believed that once emancipated, Black people could prove themselves worthy of inclusion in the fellowship of civilized humanity. However, he points out by the second half of the 19th century, things had changed uh, quite um, radically and attitudes had hardened. And by the 1850s and the 1860s, there was a more aggressive and openly derogatory racialism uh, to the point that in the 19th century, no um, sensible, as he says, no sensible intellectual believed in the inherent intellectual quality, equality of blacks. And this includes even Charles Darwin, who I mentioned before, produced this work to argue um, essentially for abolition um, of slavery at the time. So as I point out here, vindication, vindicationalism is at once a practice of providing evidence to refute a disagreeable or incorrect claim and a practice of reclamation and redemption of what has been de denied. And so in um, talking about the vindicationalist tradition, Scott mentions Reverend James Theodore Holly um, as, uh, as a prominent person who kicks off this uh, tradition. Um, he uh, produced this work, as you can see, Vindication of the Capacity of the Negro Race, and this is based on Haiti. And so Haiti comes to take on a very prominent and important role um, in this tradition, um, which then has a very long trajectory continuing on, of course, until the 20th century. But as we can see um, from Yamagata's introduction of Toussaint Louverture, the symbolic uh, power of the Haitian Revolution is not only um, it's it's not only not only powerful in the Atlantic world. So Haiti's uh, symbolic power in the Atlantic world um, is over. It's pinned on three foundational um, three foundations: uh, the rejection of enslavement, colonialism, and racial hierarchy, and the idea of white supremacy. So if we look at the symbolic power of the Haitian Revolution in Japan, we can see that the, its power lies only in the last of this, the rejection of the notion of racial hierarchy. Uh, in addition to this, uh, Yamagata makes a number of changes that makes him palatable to um, the Japanese public of the time and his audience of young uh, Japanese readers. I'll come to that next. Okay, so the major period saw a proliferation of uh, biographies. And so the genre that developed at the time uh, was distinguished from earlier forms um, of um, biography by its sustained 
emphasis on an individual uh, figure. So of course, in the past, there were biographies in the form of warrior tales, um, uh, secular biographies, and so on. But in the Meiji period, um, the, a new tradition was superimposed on that. And this took into, uh, had a greater sustained emphasis on an individual. Importantly, those who were initially subjected to biographical treatment in the early Meiji period were Europeans and Americans. Uh, and interestingly, Napoleon was the foremost subject, and this actually predates the Meiji period going back into the Edo period. Also important as subjects of biography were industrialists and engineers. Um, you may have heard of Samuel Smiles' Self-Help, which was translated in 1871 uh, under the title of Saigo Kurishihen, Western Success uh, Stories. And this was very popular and reprinted many times. So the genre that emerged in the Meiji period was developed around the European subject. And what happens is that later, um, Japanese figures are fitted into this biographical mold in an attempt to universalize the list. And so the aim of inserting Japanese figures into this new genre of biography was to transform European, um, sorry, to transform uh, Japanese and later East Asian figures, literary figures, military figures, and political figures into world-class heroes. So in doing, in, in producing a biography of Toussaint Louverture, uh, Yamagata is making a very powerful political statement. Uh, what he is doing is to assert the parity of this black hero with European models. However, if we take a closer look, uh, we can see some complications of uh, the, this uh, understanding of what Yamagata is doing. So as I've argued elsewhere, uh, the publication in which uh, this work uh, was um, printed, uh, Shonen N, uh, it was conceived as an outdoor space of adventure. So what Yamagata did with this magazine was that he wanted um, uh, young boys to imagine themselves being in the, the great outdoors. And the idea of this was that there would be an outdoor space of adventure where Japanese youth could vicariously engage in exploration and adventure. And so this is in to emulate um, the imperial officer class. So much of the material in this magazine um, borrows from British magazines of the period um, talking about um, what colonial officers are doing. The target audience of Shonenen were middle, uh, mid middle school students, male students, who were described um, as society's upper crust. And so they were just destined to be the ones to lead the nation in the future. As I discussed in uh, this work, a um, bit of self-promotion, is that um, the reason that Yamagata published um, this um, magazine in this format was to bolster the imperial project. And to, imper and, and to socialize young Japanese into imperial subjecthood. In the same year that uh, to, uh, Yamagata published the biography of Louverture, he appealed for Japan to claim lands in China, the American West, and the South Seas. So by claiming these lands, he said, we will enrich our country. So not only did he propose, uh, pro um, um, encourage overseas conquest, he also uh, platformed those who had similar um, ideas. Uh, as just one example, Shige Shigetaka, who was a proponent of Nanshinnon, so the colonization of the South Sea Islands, um, he was a frequent contributor to Shonenen. Uh, and his 1887 work, uh, Nanyo Jiji, Current Conditions of the South Seas, was actually serialized first in Shonenen. At about this time, Shiga was to argue that it was an urgent task to inspire our countrymen's spirit of overseas uh, expansion. So how do we square uh, Yamagata's championing of imperial expansion with his celebration of uh, Toussaint Louverture, who perhaps more than any other individual undermined the argument for imperialism? Um, so we can see quite clearly here that although at first glance, it looks as if Yamagata is part of a vindicationalist tradition, um, and this is one um, that uh, many Black nationalists continued. Um, it, it wasn't, of course, um, exactly the same project. 
They overlapped, but were not identical. So matters of enslavement and colonialism were not areas of concern for Yamagata. The only overlap was on the question of race. So stripped of this, um, this these other trappings of the vindicationalist tradition, the story um, that Yamagata gave only turned out to be an aspirational tale. And you can see that in the introduction to the work where you can see the limits of his ambitions because at the end he says, this biography is really to encourage young Japanese to, to, to assert their position in the world. So as the scholar Jeffrey Elton memorably pointed out, uh, one should not suppose that in writing biography, they're writing history. And uh, Charles Forsdick, who is um, who studies um, uh, Toussaint Louverture, has written on him, um, has demonstrated um, what he calls um, an ideological instrumentalization of Toussaint Louverture, which he says begins from the very beginning. Each biographer of Toussaint Louverture, he says, engages with preceding representations of him, aiming to complement, con correct or contradict them. And so the Louverture that we encounter today um, is the product of a cumulative archive of representations rather than any uh, historically authenticable figure. And we should point out that this ideological instrumentalization of Toussaint Louverture also extends to black nationalists in the, in the vindicationalist tradition, um, who themselves have a specific figuration of Toussaint Louverture, which often removes, which often elides uh, much of his biography. Um, this includes uh, Louverture's uh, authoritarian bent. Um, so although Louverture fought for freedom to overthrow the system of chattel slavery, he wanted to retain the plantation system. Um, he really, he saw himself as a French person and wanted to remain part of France. Uh, and even after um, rejecting um, the system of enslavement, he um, essentially forced uh, the population to return to the plantations, um, working as free labor, but to maintain French control of the land. Uh, and those who uh, challenged him in, 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 in important cases um, were killed. So to understand how we achieve, so we reach this um, figuration of Toussaint Louverture in the Japanese context, uh, we need to see how um, other, how he was ideologically instrumentalized earlier by other writers. And we have to remember as well that Yamagata is working off of material that he receives in Japan. Although Yamagata doesn't explicitly state um, the source of his work, all available evidence points to it being uh, Toussaint Louverture, a biography and autobiography uh, written by Reverend John Relly Baird, um, published in 1863. This is the one here on the left. As you can see, this is actually a later edition of the work in the middle, um, which was published in London 10 years earlier under the title of The Life of Toussaint Louverture, The Negro Patriot of Haiti. The London published version was itself based on other sources, as you can see moving over to the right. Um, this was based on um, mainly uh, French language works, uh, notably Memoir de la, de la Vie de Toussaint Louverture by uh, saint Remy, uh, And Baird rewrote it because he thought um, that uh, saint Remy, um was partial and unjust, and he wanted to correct um, his, his, his misinterpretations of the Haitian Revolution. And so he says um, in the London work, um, based on the French one, that his aim, sorry, I should point out that this work is written by uh, Baird is a Unitarian minister. And what he wants to do is to show that the downtrodden Negro race are capable of the loftiest versions and virtues and the most heroic uh, efforts. And 
He also wanted to demonstrate how the American system of slavery stymied the spread of God's word. Um, so if you will remember at this point, this is 18, the 1850s, in the British territory, slavery um, uh, has been abolished. This is abolished in 1933, um, and then in 1938, it's finally come into force. Um, uh, but it continues in the US. So his work is um, a use of the case of Toussaint Louverture to speak against the American system of slavery, which he says uh, prevents those in bondage from achieving Christian enlightenment. And so uh, Louverture was uh, actually quite attractive for Baird because Louverture championed Roman Catholicism. So he wanted the national religion of Haiti to be uh, Catholicism. Um, and he liked uh, Louverture because, in his words, uh, Louverture rejected superstition. Uh, and the superstition, Baird says, takes much of its force from old African traditions and observances, as well as the peculiarly, peculiar successfully, sorry, uh, tripping off my words, takes much of its force from old African traditions and observances, as well as from the peculiar susceptibilities of the Negro temperament. The American version of the biography, published in 1863, um, was published, of course, in the midst of the US Civil War. And it was published in Boston by an anti-slavery activist, John Redpath. Uh, so Redpath um, was actually um, very um, interested in Haiti. He published works on Haiti, A Guide to Haiti, for example, and he lobbied the US government to give diplomatic recognition uh, to Haiti. So with the US Civil War, the question of the martial ability of black enslaved men became a matter of heated debate. And so Baird actually published this work in the US and made multiple changes to it in order to enter that debate. In his introduction, he says, are Negroes fit for officers? And then he says, the life of Toussaint may help to end this debate. The leaders of the Haitian Revolution were all plantation hands, yet they were able warriors and statement, statesmen, all of them. So someone, any um, enslaved person still toiling in the rice fields or among the sugar canes or hoeing his cotton row in the southern states may be meditating today and destined to begin to, to, to tomorrow. So the British version um, in the 1853, in 1853, is very much a Christian tract to argue against, argue for abolition. The one in 1863, uh, in the midst of the Civil War, basically asserting that yes, um, the big question then was whether um, the black black men should be fighting um, in in the Civil War, and that was his answer: yes, uh, they should. So this ideological instrumentalization, as in to use four six terms, is obviously evident in the British, American, and Japanese, and of course the French um, biographical treatments. So in um, the American editions and the British editions of Baird, um, it's Baird goes through um, makes a huge attempt to distinguish Louverture from his fellow uh, revolutionaries. So for Baird, Louverture was a Christian leader, promoting his faith among those um, inclined to heathenism. And so Baird naturally, um, he will he peppers his biography with references to uh, the redemptive force of uh, Christianity. So for example, he notes that although uh, Toussaint became every day more and more aware that, aware that he was a slave, Religion allowed him to avoid a murmuring spirit such that he could make the best of his position in which he had been born without yielding to the degrading notion that his hardships were irremediable. So Baird's belief that Christianity could, in his words, make uh, the slave's cabin an abode of the purest happiness of earth um, led him to champion matrimony amongst the enslaved. So of course, um, religious matters were of course uh, of little concern to Yamagata, but like Baird, it suited his purpose to portray Louverture as different from um, his quote unquote bloodthirsty kin. So this is going back to saint Romy's uh, description. So describing scenes uh, from the first revolts of 1791, Baird describes the proceedings as so horrible that Toussaint could take no part. 
Yamagata's version does not shy away from these graphic descriptions of violence by the revolutionaries. Um, and in fact, he employs language that associates the behavior of the revolutionaries in, in Haiti um, to um, the headhunting practices of indigenous uh, Ty Taiwanese. And so this is, of course, coded as particularly barbaric in major discourse. As an example of um, an image from the Japanese um, translation. That said, uh, Yamagata, in doing so, Yamagata deracializes literature and bolsters his heroic credentials by removing references to the humiliated conditions in which the enslaved were subjected. And so here it's important to note that um, key to the uh, the vindica vindica oh God, vindicationist tradition of black nationalists, um, the role of dehumanization, the role of slavery in the dehumanization of black people is, is central. Um, but remember, of course, for uh, Yamagata, the target is not slavery. So Yamagata largely strips his account of the dehumanization um, of Toussaint Louverture because this would not be compatible with him being a hero. So many elements that are specific to uh, Black people's becoming or a new, Afri I'm sorry, new world African uh, diasporic identity is removed. And this simply leaves Toussaint as a figure of overcoming. So I give some examples here. So Baird, for example, details the horrors of the Middle Passage, so the transport of enslaved Africans um, from the West Coast of Africa to the Americas. Um, and he's, he mentions that thousands perished by suffocation. Of course, this is removed. Um, he, just, he goes into a lot of detail of the regular rapes of enslaved women. Um, you see here, for example, lust and brutality outrage mothers and daughters unscrupulously, preferring as victims the young and innocent. That is removed. Mention of violent uh, punishment. Um, so um, Baird here talks of Toussaint hearing the twang of the driver's whip and, and seeing the blood streaming um, from the Negro's body. Uh, Yamagata omits all of these discussions of horrors. And this is all necessary to mold Louverture into a figure fit for major biography. Um, but he also makes additions uh, to make him a heroic subject. Um, so for example, um, Louverture, as all um, Meiji heroes, must display moral probity and erudition from an early age. So whereas Baird um, in the American version portrays shepherding, a job that, um, uh, yeah, uh, that Louverture did, as something common um, to enslaved people, um, he says the duty of the young slave was definite and uniform. Uh, Yamagata says that Louverture is exemplary at it. Baird, for example, describes Louverture as weak and infirm in his youth. And of course, Yamagata omits this, inserting instead a new detail, um, saying that Toussaint, uh, his character was so peaceful that he could not so much as hurt a fly. Uh, and Baird also <laughs> portrays Louverture's academic ability as modest. Um, he says he seems to have made some progress in the arts of reading, writing, and drawing, and notes that a scholar in the high sense of the term, he never became. However, for Yamagata, uh, Louverture was nothing short of a philosopher. So Yamagata stresses Louverture's love of learning. He talks and he lists every single book that he read and was learned, and it's a very long uh, list. Um, he says that he would read them through the night. And uh, so of course he said that he would read all day, all night and then work all day. So he obviously needed no sleep. So during and after work, Yamagata said, Louverture's reading would enable him to reflect deeply on matters. And then as a final flourish, Yamagata adds that Louverture also had the habit of quoting from books he had read. And that's obviously not a detail in any of the English sources. In 2004, uh, David Scott, the anthropologist who I mentioned uh, before, published uh, Conscripts of Modernity, uh, which was an analysis of another rendering uh, of Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. Um, so um, this was by CLR uh, James, um, work entitled Black Jacobins. Um, the conscript to which Scott refers in the title of the work is Toussaint Louverture. Scott argues that key to capturing the past of colonial subjects lies in recognizing their obligation 
to live in terms and worlds mounted by the modern West. Modern power, he points out, was constitutive, making the very subject that might desire resistant. He points out that Toussaint Louverture had no choice but to act and strategize on conditions created by European modernity. So Toussaint, a slave turned liberator, for example, to give one example of, um, of, of how he had to work within these conditions, in ordering, um, in liberating the slaves, he then said and the newly enslaved people had to return uh, to the plantations. And that was because he could not imagine liberty independent of the very civilization that sought to return him and his people to slavery. The point um, that um, Scott makes in his reading of um, CLR James's Black Jacobins is that James recognizes that it's not, this is not a, a, a it's not the story of uh, overcoming, but one of tragedy. Writing in 1890, Yamagata was perhaps able to sense the costs of revolution, even as he celebrated a revolutionary hero. The independent Republic of Haiti was largely shunned with European and American powers refusing to recognize its independence by establishing diplomatic ties. So they refused to, to establish diplomatic ties, thereby denying its independence and its, even its existence. So it was ignored. Indeed, France would only do so after Haiti uh, paid reparations, and these burdensome reparations were not paid off until the mid 20th century. An immediate consequence of the Haitian Revolution, uh, and let's not forget that for this, it means that France has lost all of Haiti's plantations, which produce, as I said before, half of the coffee, uh, sugar, half of the coffee, sorry, consumed in Europe and the Americas. And so a consequence of this was the expansion of slavery elsewhere. The eventual abolition of slavery in the Americas led European and American powers to look to Asia for cheap labor. And Japan soon looked to be sucked into the system of indentured labor, which was intended to replace enslaved African labor. So this picture here is, um, it shows uh, laborers from Japan who were recruited by the then consul of Hawaii, uh, Eugene, Eugene Van Reed. Um, he, sorry, the consul of Hawaii based in Yokohama, he attempted to recruit uh, Japanese laborers to work on sugarcane fields um, in Hawaii. Uh, the migrants, as you can see here, uh, were in very destitute uh, conditions. Uh, they faced harsh labor conditions um, and lived in um, huts of, of the type you can see here. Uh, they were left destitute to the point that many had to be rescued by the Japanese government, who as a consequence decided to exert more direct control over dispatching migrant laborers overseas. In addition, the end of slavery actually saw the rise of new ideologies of domination, one of which was the topic uh, that Yamagata uh, discussed, scientific racism, which came to the fore actually after the abolition of slavery. And so Yamagata, for his time, that felt that this was the most pertinent issue uh, in the Japanese case. So I will conclude here. Um, just to summarize, I've been showing a few of the changes that Yamagata introduced to mold Louverture to the template of a Meiji hero. And so by doing so, he uh, domesticates him, he enshrines him, um, not so much into a Japanese pantheon, but an emerging universal one, which was shaped by representations of European figures. Though Yamagata describes Louverture as a black hero, he is largely stripped of uh, his blackness and in that sense of any link to Africa. So the appearance of a Japanese biography of Toussaint Louverture, and in the late 19th century, no less, would seem to undermine assertions, um, and most notably the assertion of Michel Rovetrio, who is a, a Haitian academic, who argued that the Haitian revolution had been silenced. In 1995, Troyo asserted that the historical corpus had remained silent on the most radical political revolution of the age. But by silencing, he referred not to a lack of a mention of the Haitian Revolution or its heroes, but a lack of understanding of its significance. Little was published in the years um, following this about uh, the 
about, sorry, <laughs> this was published in the years um, following Yamagata's uh, biography about the Haitian Revolution or about Toussaint Louverture. Indeed, the next mention of Haiti that I was able to find was by the colonial theorist uh, Nitobe Inazo. Nitobe described colonialism as the spread of civilization, a beneficial process in which advanced people offer their knowledge, technologies, and capital to contribute to the development of undeveloped land. For Nitobe, Haiti was a cautionary tale. For those who refuse civilization offered by the colonizer. They are doomed to regress, he asserted. Look at the, form, at the fate of the former French colony of Haiti, he said. Once a flourishing plantation economy under French rule, having achieved independence, it became a place of disease and stagnation. In a word, the island of ogres. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic, very thought-provoking talk. Um, as you collect um, your thoughts for questions, I just wanted to say, when I joined SOAS in 2013, 10 years ago, I was tasked to teach a course called World Social Theory. And in 2013, it started with Rousseau. So we're not really... <laughs> all that far away from that. And uh, now we have, and it, it ended with Franz Fanon, only in the very last session. But now, of course, we have CLR James uh, in there as well. But I think it's it's important to, to yes, there is a certain mystique around SOAS, right? But we're, we're, often we're not all that good, actually, of um, uh, absorbing the content that we claim on our websites uh, to be teaching. Um, so starting, I just I just wanted to start this off um, because this is um, it's it's really very fascinating. I, I wondered whether there was a translation of the Black Jacobins into Japan and what 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 happened to that because obviously politically speaking it's a very different context. I think it was published in nineteen thirty seven, so also we are in a different um, sort of time period. But there's also uh, people like Antenor uh, Fermin who tried to combat racist ideas on. This on the same level, he, he read Gobineau and thought this is nonsense, and and responded by writing this wonderful massive tome, rejecting each and every single ideas therein. But also that is really it hasn't really entered the canon. So there, I think there is there's an, an interesting um, uh, point to be made about the silencing um, of the Haitian Revolution. But do these have an afterlife in, in Japan as well? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, regarding CLA, CLR James's uh, The Black Jacobin, uh, yeah, that has been, uh, that was translated into, that was published in 1991, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and it is one of those accounts of the Haitian Revolution that I am looking at, um, but about which I cannot say that much because I'm actually I'm, I'm focusing now on um, the the 19th century um, ones. But uh, yes, it it was um, translated um, as it, as you get to the late 20th century, um, you start seeing um, more academic um, translations, uh, more annotations. I think that's really interesting to see how. Um, uh, how, yeah, how how people are engaging uh, with the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I actually found quite interesting is that um, it's not just that work uh, by CLR James that has been translated into Japanese. Um, his works, his more um, his works on uh, post-colonial Caribbean life as well um, have been translated into Japanese. So there is, I think, an appetite um, for this type of um, information. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Opening up to the crowd. Yes, please. Well, thank you very much for a very rich and stimulating talk. Um, I just wanted to put a word in for an, another name, but entirely negatively, really. Um, um, Herbert Spencer, um, in as far as uh, I believe that it was Spencer who was translated to Japanese and Chinese before Darwin mm -hmm. and was the major influence in political thought um to simplify you know darwin was a naturalist biologist who threw off many shackles of that's not all but most whereas spencer was it was uh, 
um, writing of evolution as a political process with its with a racialized background, which is not you know, and, and that was surely influencing thought at the time, not not just the news as well, yeah. Yeah, um, yes, <laughs> that's correct. Um, uh, the influence of Spencer was was huge, um, obviously not just in the case of introducing what we might today call social Darwinism, um, but his uh, work on education, for example, hugely uh, influential. Um, I think because Spencer um, was the way to which many people had um, encountered Darwin, that then led to a desire to actually read Darwin itself more closely. And so uh, Yamagata's translations of Darwin, I think, are part of that sort of reaction against um, reading Darwin secondhand through this sort of politicized lens. Mm. Not many people really, but um, I mean, hands up, please let the origin of speech we're beginning to end. Okay, so I've yeah. been teaching it for a number of years, but <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I, d I don't think many people read that Yamagata's um, <laughs> translation either. I think it, it, in the sense, the translation was him working through um, these ideas. It was definitely a personal uh, project. It's not an easy book to read. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I would be interested in knowing more about Yamagata. Who was him? I read a little bit uh, later in the culture that you, but what kind of context, in what kind of context he was interested for this uh, literature? Um, so he is initially a teacher, so he's trained, his, his his big area of focus is education. And so uh, hopefully I'm, I'm remembering is correct. He works initially as a translator for the government, for the Ministry of Education. And so he does lots of textbooks. Um, so he, yeah, he comes as a translator. Um, but after that, he, yeah, he does a lot of sort of personal <laughs> um, work, these translations of Darwin and so on. Um, but most notably, he creates this magazine, Shonen N, um, in 1888, um, as a sort of extracurricular complement to the education system. So he's very interested in, in education, but he doesn't want to really step on the toes of um, those. The education is the preserve of the government. He wants to create an outdoor external space for um uh, for these uh, middle school students to transpose their their textbook understanding to the real world uh, through this book, uh, through this uh, magazine. And so this magazine, uh, again, he's a translator, has lots of translations um, uh, from, uh, you can see through it that he reads very widely um, of the international press, especially the British press uh, and British magazines. So there's a lot of content there from that. And he has a very wide network amongst um, Japanese intellectuals, uh, some of whom I mentioned in the talk, who then also contribute um, to this magazine. So I guess his legacy, if you will, is this, this, um, this the establishment of this new idea of an, a, a, an adolescent magazine that can complement uh, the education system. What kind of distribution, how much did this magazine circulate? Uh, it's hard to know for sure, but a very crude measure is how easy it is to get them today. Uh, and it's not hard to get them um, today. It only lasted six um, uh, years. It was uh, shut down in the aftermath of the, the first Sino-Japanese War. Um, and so, but yeah, in that period, it, there, there wasn't much competition in that early period. And so I think it did quite well, but I don't know. In in his book, he has a, um, an autobiography. He says that about uh, 10,000 copies um, were were printed each, each issue. So that's what he says, but yeah, which would be really good, <laughs> actually, yeah. Yeah, but in terms of the influence of um of this work, for example, it doesn't seem to yeah there doesn't seem to be much written or much followed up. Um, usually you can look at the um the uh, letters to the editor of the following issue to see how certain things went down, and there's very little mention of this work even then. Yes. Thank you very much. I wasn't quite clear why the person chose Tucson as a subject of translation if it, it required so much work to sort of be racialized. Because presumably there were other heroes around in the 1870s 
um, that could be chosen. I sort of what it is about Toussaint that speaks to well, well, this person and, and, and the kind of Japanese public. So um, he maybe to racialize is probably the wrong word because I think he chooses him because he is black. And so because he is black and he is this hero um, and hero in a sort of vernacular that the major public can understand because he's a military hero and in his rendering, a very uh, literate moral person. Um, and the very fact that he is black and able to subvert the racial hierarchy by concrete, by defeating uh, European powers in battle makes him ideal for the point that he wants to make. Uh, the point about maybe deracialization is not so much as he's, um, he's not black because he does say a black hero, but in this figuration of Toussaint Louverture in the Japanese context, it's not what, what makes him uh, appealing to like a black nationalist who wants to use him for the vindicationalist um, sort of writings um, that is removed from the Japanese version because the the in, the the sort of focus for Yamagata is simply this idea of racial hierarchy and nothing else, not about uh, colonization or even so much enslavement. I don't know. I'm just thank you so much mm -hmm. for that uh, very inspiring talk. I I really enjoyed it. I just 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 thinking, just guessing, but because 1880s, 1890s, um, well, I, I don't like to generalize, but um, Japan, to some intellectuals were reacting to rapid westernization. And, you know, by that time, all the uh, modernization pro programs have been finished, but then, you know, they sort of started to think about, uh, I don't know, sort of Japanese sort of identity and sort of went against a bit against like westernization so i don't know maybe he had that sort of element as well <laughs> by choosing black hero instead mm. of white heroes mm. i don't know i'm just yeah 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 thank you yeah that's a, a really good point i think um yeah, and it fits within this sort of broadening of the canon of the subjects for biography, because, yes, in the 1870s, they start off as being like, Euro you know, European uh, scientists, engineers, industrialists, uh, and then it expands to literary figures, politicians, statesmen, and then you start seeing the broadening of the canon by bringing in uh, deliberately um, figure Asian figures, because the idea is that you have you can put them into this mold and and it's broader it's not just europeans um so yeah it, it fits entirely um within within that um i actually made reference to um a work um by i think his name's miyagi uh i forgot his name sorry <laughs> anyway he he um discusses um koyagi his um he discusses um a biography of the prophet muhammad in in japanese and he's the one who makes this point that you know um 1890s uh, turn of the century you really see this move to create a broader um sub um broader canon broader um idea of who should be subject to biography yes it's just a comment. It's interesting that this um, sort of searching of the black hero is occurring in the 1870s and 1880s, that you're saying. And of course, it's happening at the same time that European colonial power is being exerted. Of, I mean, this is the 1880s, of course, it's the time of scramble by Africa. Mm -hmm. And so European colonial power is being completely exerted. So they're very, and, and, and so you don't see, I mean, you, of course, you see lots of resistance. To colonial expansion in Africa, but the overall story is the suppression of African mm -hmm. communities and African societies. So it's interesting that you have this kind of black military hero at exactly the time yeah. that African military power is being you know, put up all around the world. Yeah, and and Yamagata is not arguing against that. In fact, he is is for that. Um, he he recognizes that. Yeah, this. So yeah, I get the point I, I tried to make, but not not very effectively, was that the issues um that 
had animated earlier debates um, that were key to uh, Toussaint's time, the ideas of enslavement empire, those are not issues for Yamagata. He, the issue for him is uh, white supremacy because his interest is Japanese supremacy. Um, so yeah, it fits exactly with the time because you can't, you, you, if you want to be in, involved in empire, you can't be then talking against empire. So, um, so that's what's happening in his work. Thank you. Just looking at, um, yes, that is, <laughs> I, I've done that. Yes. <laughs> Barbara said, stop, <laughs> stop <laughs> screen sharing so we can see us. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. <laughs> as far as I know, there are lots of introduction to the Japanese reader. Uh, about the Kusan Blue Tube was done by Shibashu. Oh, you know, no, no, Shibashu, I mean, Hokai Sanchi. No, no, oh, it is. <laughs> so new. Uh, yes. You know, the have been to the uh, what same counters with uh, what year was this? Uh, it's a, it's a book, and uh, I did that before that, uh, because they. Lots of heroes, mm. uh, uh, revolution or counter economic heroes, such as Morai, mm. uh, or Irish independence movement. Well, of course, uh, uh, we say that, we say that. Mm. so, uh, for, for the author, Shibashu, uh, they are one of the heroes, mm. uh, which, uh, uh, called state against the uh, white rules of Colombia. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to know uh, the Yamagata uh, mm -hmm. uh, has some relationship with the uh, Shibashio. I met with the author, oh, I mentioned. But even though uh, I, I, um, I And uh, one word, uh, Question is there. Are there any common characteristics among the people or humans mm. raised in the shonen? Mm. Or, for example, to some group, group chat, a special one, or just one? one. <laughs> in, in, uh, uh. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I would like to speak to you after <laughs> about that because obviously yeah, there's a, a huge gap uh, <laughs> in uh, the the sort of chrono chronology that I presented. Um, in terms of um, the heroes um, presented by uh, Yamagata, um, it, it was common to do profiles um, in um, the magazine. And so you had profiles, uh, yes, in pretty much every uh, issue. Um, and of course, this, these were supposed to be moral uh, exemplars uh, for the young readers to be able to learn from uh, the behavior and the dispositions of those um, people. I guess the main difference with uh, Yamagata is that he he's being uh, presented to challenge this idea, this idea of race. He, the, the, a big point is made of his, of his race. That's the um, point that is foregrounded um, in the title um, in presenting him. And uh, no one else is given an entire issue. The entire issue is handed over, if you will, to the biography of Toussaint Louverture. So it's very long. It's a 30 page uh, pamphlet, um, whereas in the other cases, um, it will be one or two pages and they just form part of, of the of, of every issue. Sometimes they're serialized um, and so they're a bit longer. But yeah, this is um, clearly for Yamagata um, a, a different case because he uh, turns over so much attention and uh, so much of the magazine to him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, one more. Do you, do you know if um, <clears throat> that interest in Tucson then spread elsewhere, like to China or anywhere else? I'd be very interested um, to know <laughs> to know that. I, th the answer to that is no, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I uh, would be very interested if anyone <laughs> has, is aware of that, then please do get in touch. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, thank you for your lecture. 
Um, can you just because we don't have as you say we come from a visual um editorial uh, and the we have set up a uh, little bit of an effect with the circulation of readers, why does he then change the media and was do you think that there was um a, an erasure of, of this kind of discussion of black heroes in generally in the real the 20th century, or do you think this is an archival problem that perhaps these things were not um, indexed as much as the admiration for Western heroes, or um, I'm thinking also of um, sort of models of masculinity at that time in Messi and Colbert, and this kind of idea of chivalry and the values of sexual masculinity. And I wondered where this fit, uh, this kind of material between more generally of, of this period and of some hero, like the um, idealized hero poets of today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, that's really interesting uh question i suspect it's a combination <laughs> um to give a, <laughs> a bit of a cop-out answer um i think part of it is not necessarily that the archives don't or the material doesn't exist is that it's not really analyzed or looked for that as a question as a research question they haven't really sort of existed and so that need to catalog to 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 categorize um perhaps hasn't been there as much and i think once you start looking um you're able to find um so for example uh, i briefly mentioned for example the um treaty ports and you know people rubbing shoulders and if we look at the treaty ports or general accounts of the treaty ports it's all about you know these diplomats these travelers whatever and and there were a minority of the people in those ports there's mainly these sailors and so it's a hugely like you have the world if you will in these treaty ports which uh, hasn't really been um, looked at in much detail. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, it is definitely an issue of um, what questions are being asked of the material. And I think if once you start digging into the material, um, then uh, these become apparent. Yeah. Thank you. You want to guess? It's a related question to the two earlier ones. Um, I, you, you mentioned an author who said that the Haitian Revolution or the story of Haiti had been silenced. And I think you said the latest 1995, I forget the name of the author. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I, it's not a view that I recognize in the literature at all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, earlier speaker mentioned the Black Jacobin, which, as you said, was in the 1930s, but even you know all, all the literature mm -hmm. around the revolution in S slavery in the Americas, um, 1980s, early 1990s, all kind of have Haiti as a as a central part. In a, in a famous publication by Genovese in I forget when it was, but certainly the 1980s, mm -hmm. speaks about you know from the period to revolution as Haiti as a kind of as a central focus of of uh, slave activity and the revolution. And so I don't see I don't see Haiti being silenced. At all, I suppose is what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, it has always had a very important um place or role in the sort of Black nationalist tradition, of which I would include CLR James and many of the writers that you've mentioned. Um, uh, Tkoyo, I think when he was talking, um, when he when he wrote that it had been silenced, uh, his reference was to. Um, the broader history of the Age of Revolutions. So we talk about the Age of Revolutions, the Enlightenment, and it's a European story. Um, and so Scott, for example, when he does, he reads um, uh, uh, C.L.R. James's uh, Black Jacobin, um, he and analyzes it. He he then goes on to the, the most prominent. Um, sort of chronicle chroniclers of empire, Russian empire, uh, of um, revolution, Re Re French revolution, uh, Russian revolution, and so on. And in these accounts of the of the world age of revolutions, his uh, Haiti is 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 not mentioned. It's mentioned as a slave revolt rather than enacting the principles of the Enlightenment. And so I think that was the point that he was trying to make. But in definitely in sort of a black nationalist tradition. There's uh, Haiti has always held um, a prominent role. So yes, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's general, you're the same. But, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Anybody else? Um, or I think yes. The that was just 
but thank you for <laughs> stopping the screen share. Um, excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We'll stay with an idea of general Eurocentrism maybe <laughs> at the end. Maybe that's a good good place to to sort of stop and bear in mind. Yeah. So thank you very much, Marcel, <laughs> for a fantastic talk. Um, Thank you all for coming, and uh, remember next week is reading week, so there will be uh, no lecture, and we'll continue again with Azaba Yuko's talk on uh, Japan and tango, Argentinian tango in Japan, passions, emotions, and performance. So do join us. I think that's on the 15th of uh, November. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>